Uh, well, welcome back at uh, Code Camp. We're excited to have you here, and uh, welcome back, back, everyone. Um, Vlad, I thought you were going to say welcome back. Welcome back. Your turn. Yeah, but but I haven't had my third coffee today, so. <laughs> Oh my goodness, you are many coffees behind. Yeah, although actually yes. in your time zone, I would probably be slowing down from having too much coffee at this point. No, 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 never, never. I'm staying through the night. <laughs> well, um, Kevin, so I, I wanted to say a few words about you to those very few people in the audience that uh, haven't heard, ha haven't seen your talk uh, at our last architecture, one, one of my favorite talks, yeah. hands down. So thank you. Thank Looking you. forward to, to today. So um, kind people, Kevin, Mr. Kevin Henney is an uh, independent consultant, speaker, writer, and trainer. He's an avid open source contributor, loves committees, loves to, to be part of as many committees as possible. Um, is the co-author of um, a few books, a few very interesting books, such as Pattern uh, Language for Distributed Computing and uh, on Patterns and uh, Pattern Languages. You know, and I, I noticed one, one very interesting thing, uh, Kevin, you're the editor of uh, two books, 97 Things Every Programmer Should Know, yep. and 97 Things Every Java Programmer Should Know. And I wanted to ask, are those different? Yes, they are. They are, um, or rather every Java programmer should know the first 97 things, um, <laughs> but also those books were produced 10 years apart. So um, you'll find the advice, um, the advice in the general programmer's book that was published in 2010 is, is broad, you know, it, it'll, it'll apply to everyone. There's a little bit of code in the book, but because it's much more general, it can't be about the mechanics or the environment of a particular programming language. And the book I um, edited with Trisha G last year, the 97 Things Java book, uh, it's kind of obviously it has a platform, it has a language, there's a focus there, but it does allow us to get into the code. And I was about half the pieces of advice there, I would say, are broadly applicable um, across languages. Um, but it's not a case of it's just for Java programmers. Yeah. It just has that as its central focus. And the, one of the benefits is there's a lot more code in the book because, hey, we picked a language. We can talk about code and therefore we can talk about limitations and issues. And people can be much more specific about particular classes of architecture, such as containers and so on. Um, so, um, you know, if you like, I guess there's uh, 194 things that you should know. Yeah, I'm putting them on uh, on my to-do list. <laughs> so. I'm relieved now. I thought a Java developer needs to know 97 more things than a .NET developer. So that's not the case. Yeah, I, and, you know, I bet if we did a .NET version, I bet if we did a .NET version, because that was one of the discussions, um, which way to go on this. I bet if we did a .NET version, we would end up, again, with a book that is broadly applicable, but it has an area of concentration. You know, it'll have some things that won't speak to you specifically, but I would assume that most of the advice is, is generally good because a lot of the stuff was like, talking about community, uh, career, uh, your general stack, um, and then certain specific features, um, some of which are also present in other languages, but clearly we're trying to give a focus in one particular area. So that's one of the things sometimes I... I do it with my training courses as well, which are not about languages. So if I do a TDD course, I have to pick a language because we need something to chew on. We can't just throw our hands in there and say, oh, this is kind of it. No, we need examples and I've got to choose something. Um, and so some of the items in any language specific book, like the 97 Things books, would be, well, we have to pick a language. Here's the language. And half of that advice easily transfers across. Um, so, yeah. All right. Absolutely. Makes sense. Absolutely. <laughs> Plus, it helps you anchor, be more anchored to, to concrete things rather than just talking about uh, abstract uh, ideas. Yeah, and I think that's that's quite important. And even if somebody's not working with language, I, I was working with uh, somebody this week. They and we were kind of targeting mostly Java, a bit of C sharp, but this person was Python. So I throw in a few Python comments and observations. Uh, but we have to pick a language specifically, and uh, and it's a, just a case of like, well, here's what it would look like. But we have to have a center of gravity, if you like. You know, let me let's just show most of these, and then we generalize as human beings. Uh, what's the quote from Alfred North Whitehead, the guy who um, uh, worked with Bertrand Russell? Uh, he made the observation that we think in generalities, but we live in detail, and I think that's kind of important. 
That's a really good quote, actually. <laughs> yeah, that's why I remember it. It's just like, it's such a good one for programmers. It's because sometimes we get lost in one or the other. We kind of need both. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The forest and the trees. Um, well, you'll be talking today about how to live with uh, uncertainty in, uh, in a software project. Basically, yes, uh, and... yeah, uh, oh, trying to avoid un adding unnecessary complexity to, to a system. Yeah. Before you don't know what's what's in there. So what you're saying is that I shouldn't spend six months to to design my my next project. Exactly. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. And that that is exactly the thing because that's a human response. What we do when we are confronted by uncertainty or a, a feeling of loss of control, of we're not in charge. What one of the standard human responses is, we assert more control. We assert more planning. Hey, this isn't going. Across we push down, we lock down harder, we try and control things stronger. And actually the thing to do is kind of, you kind of need to let go. Actually that is accept that and then ride the wave. That's the thing. Uh, people feel very uncomfortable with this idea of uncertainty. Um, and, and so they do their best to get rid of it rather than say, you know what, that's a fact of life. The, um, and you know, in other words, you might regard this as not just a talk on software architecture, it's a talk on life, but we had to pick a specific detail to anchor on. <laughs> Well, this certainly sounds, uh, you've piqued my interest, let's, <laughs> let's be like that. Excellent. Okay. Looking forward to, to okay, it. That's good. Yeah, right. So, um, in theory, I should be... Let's, uh, let's start the show. Yeah. So, I've shared the screen. Can everybody see that? Yep, I can. Excellent. Right. Um, so I kind of noticed a thing because last time I was last time I was here for some abstract value of here. Uh, last time I was here was last September, and I gave. I wasn't really thinking about it until I looked at uh, looked at my folder um, uh, with my presentations, and I thought the last talk I gave here was um, unreasonable architecture. So unreasonable. Now we're moving to uncertain. I feel like I want to come back here a third time so I can complete the trilogy with some other kind of doubt. Um, so, uh, Vlad already mentioned, we've already talked about uh, uh, the various books, um, these uh, books. So, uh, exploring this and also looking at detail and that, we kind of come out the other side. Here's a bunch of information, but it's not everything that we need to know, um, and it's not everything we will ever need to know. Um, this whole point is things change. Um, we do not know everything, and, we, and importantly, we cannot know everything. And that often what we do when we stop and say, I am going to design this and it's going to be the last word on the matter. Uh, we have a bit of a challenge because the universe has a very different opinion. Um, one of my favorite authors is Neil Gaiman. And he, uh, uh, he was the writer of a graphic novel, um, The Sandman, which is kind of like back end of the 1980s, early 90s, around then. Uh, very influential, kind of changed the way that comics and graphic novels are written. Um, uh, and he has a character in it called Delirium, and she is the embodiment of Delirium, somebody who is delirious and uncertain, and not really sure. And you can see it in her speech patterns. She's kind of saying, oh, what's the name for the word for things not being the same always? You know, I'm sure there is one, isn't there? And she's asking her brother, uh, Dream, who is the embodiment of dreams and also not a, 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 a not given to many words. She says, there must be a word for it. You know, the thing that lets you know time is happening. Is there a word? And I think that's a lovely way of putting it. How do we know that time is happening? What is the thing that lets us know that time is happening? And her brother responds, change. Oh, I was afraid of that. And that is the bit that human beings struggle with. Um, there are two things that humans are uncomfortable with, things remaining the same and things um, uh, uh, changing. This is, this, is the, this is the paradox with which we must uh, navigate something like software development, which accelerates the experience of change um, on a, to a much more day-to-day -day basis. Um, it, it accelerates the impact of change. And we anchor in very understandably, we talk about, we use metaphors. Because the thing with the thing in software is it's not real the way that stuff other stuff is real. You know, here's a pen, and this pen if I drop it, guess what? Gravity kicks in and it makes a noise um, and it lands. And so we use metaphors. If I go into a software environment, if you use a graphical environment, guess what? 
there's an abstraction called a pen. But it's not really a pen, it doesn't look like this. It's a pen because that's the way we describe how to put ink or color or whatever on, on a surface. So we use many metaphors. We use metaphors to describe our artifacts. We talk about windows and desktops and sockets and all of this kind of stuff. We are filled with metaphors, but we also use it to describe the way that we work and the thing, the broader aspects of the things we work on, like architecture. However, uh, if we look here, you know, here's a, because, because travel at the moment is difficult, I'm going to take you to Paris. And in fact, I took this um, photograph from Paris in 2019, May 2019, I was at the New Crafts Conference. Um, and here is a structure that we see that has stood since the 19th century. And it's a, it's, it's a, it's a wonderful piece of architecture, highly iconic, individual, durable. It has all of these qualities. The problem is that when we use this term to describe software, it's kind of curious because what we're looking at here is something that is very hard. It is very hardware. It is not open to evolution at this time scale that we're aware of. This lasts longer than human life. Software lasts shorter than human life and changes far more rapidly. It is soft rather than hard. And this is a problem because in our heads, we have this idea that, you know what? Architecture is not about change. When I look at the real world, architecture is not about change. I mean, it is, it just moves at a slower level than we work at, but software works at a much faster level. And that's the bit where we get thrown by the consequences of um, this particular choice of metaphor. Now, the point here is that architecture is not a fixed term in software. It doesn't have a unique definition. I can't go around and say, here is the book that says this is architecture. Well, there are plenty of books that will tell you that. The problem is that none of them can lay claim to what it truly is because it does, it's not truly one of these things. It's, it's many things. Different people have defined it differently over the last 50 or so years. In fact, I, I've been trying to trace the word back. And I mean, I, it was definitely in use in the 1970s, the term architecture. I suspect though we were talking about it in the 60s, but perhaps the metaphor hadn't quite taken hold. And our use of it increased through the 80s and became dominant in the 90s. Um, but the point is it's emerged from all these different sources, different people trying to use a metaphor to describe something. It's natural when you're talking about structures, you're inevitably going to talk about architecture at some point. We see this in other disciplines that also use the word architecture. It's inevitable where there is some kind of structure that is, con uh, that is created, we will eventually talk about it. So here's the challenge. Now, Martin Fowler wrote this um, in Patterns of Enterprise Application Architecture um, about 18 years ago. Um, so it's come of age. He said, architecture is a term that lots of people try to define. And this is to some degree is still true um, with little agreement. That is perhaps less true. There is more convergence. There are two common elements. It turns out that these are also uh, still true. One is the highest level breakdown of a system into its parts and the other decisions that are hard to change. Now, the problem with the first one is if you like, that's your PowerPoint architecture, that's your architecture. And it's about the big boxes in a system. The problem is that the big boxes are not where all the big decisions are. Uh, and there's a natural bias. When we look at the big box, we say, oh, that's architecture. But we don't look at the connections as being architectural. It turns out that in software, it's all about connections and relationships but it's also about other assumptions. There are things that are architectural that we, unfortunately our architecture metaphor does not let us see. Um, software does not have a natural scale, for example. Okay, so, you know, when I say a building is big, what do we mean by big? Well, I can give you a simple definition. Uh, it's big with respect to a human being. Uh, you know, human beings are of the order of two meters in height and therefore big is in relation to that and small is in relation to that. So we have a simple metric. A skyscraper is big because, well, it's big. Yeah, from a human point of view, we have an anchor that we can rely on. That's not true for software. There are lots of things that are big. There's certainly a lot of things that are too big and it's defined kind of around the cognitive scale, what goes on here, but it's that's not quite as distinct. It's not as obvious. You know, if somebody said, I've seen, I've, I've seen classes, you know, this is definitely the, uh, the Roy Batty speech. I've seen things you people wouldn't believe. I mean, I've seen uh, code bases with classes that are tens of thousands of lines long. I'm going to say that's too big. But unlike the real world, that does not collapse under its own weight. It has a, its degradation is not sudden and catastrophic. If you try and build an 800 meter tall uh, high building out of wood, well, you won't even get to 800 meters. It will have collapsed by that point, even with modern reinforced uh, woods. 
The point here is that we lack a kind of a sense of scale, but there is a scale. There is a scale. Um, the box size is not the box size. It's not the one that's important. The scale that we need to work with is how much effort is involved in moving it. That's the real trick. This is the hard to change. This is where Grady Booch uh, kicks in with architecture represents the significant design decisions that shape a system where significant is measured by cost of change. Whoa, wait a minute, it's that word again, change. That's the thing that lets you know time is happening. That's the thing that you can't necessarily know in advance. By definition, you do not know the changes your system will experience. Now, that doesn't mean you can't do something. It just means that you cannot be certain what the changes will be. We might guess at some of the changes. We might use our experience. We might use various analysis techniques to determine what appears to be stable or unstable or open-ended or closed or whatever. But we need to recognize that we do not yet know the changes. Until the system has existed, we do not know the changes it has experienced. In fact, we could say until the system has ended and its lifetime uh, has come to a close and we've ended that product, only then will we truly know the kinds of changes that we wanted, which is a little bit of a delivery problem, as you might have guessed, if so, because <laughs> at this point we need to deliver something, but we don't yet know what will happen. So this is the paradox we're always going to be dealing with. We are not yet certain, and yet we must build and commit to a software structure which represents a certainty. And we're going to get this one wrong. This is really important. We need to acknowledge that. Um, Ralph Johnson, one of the members of the Gang of Four, said, architecture is the decisions you wish you could get right early in a project, but you are not necessarily more likely to get them right than any other. This is the whole time machine problem. Um, you are not able to go back in time and tell yourself, guess what? <laughs> this small thing, it's not a small thing. It's a big thing. You should retake this decision. But it also tells us that um, we should be very cautious about trying to do everything up front. And there is a very intuitive model that many people will follow, even when they don't realize they're doing. This is the great thing is that sometimes people say, oh, the waterfall development life cycle, that was the 1960s, or the 1970s that caused this. Honestly, it's not that simple. It's a kind of inevitable that people gravitate towards this structure because it's a very human thing. You know what? Let's understand what we're going to build. Let's give that a name. Let's call it analysis. So let's understand how we're going to build it. We've figured out what it's for. We've understood the requirements. Now we're going to build it. We've um, Now that we've worked out how we're going to build it. So design establishes the architecture. It's the key design decisions. It's the ones that are big, and as well as a few of the small ones. Code is the next level down. Many people kind of say, well, code, that's just a detail. Don't worry about that. Yeah, we might need to worry a little more. And then let's just check we built the thing right. Now, I have absolutely no problem with these four activities. We can debate the names. Um, but we can't debate that we use these. We use understanding, understand why and what we're going to be building and understand how we're going to be doing that and our choices. The commitment to detail that is executable, the confirmation we built the right thing in the right way and that we understand what we're building. What we discover is that this doesn't work out particularly well, this particular ordering. It's not the activities, it's the strictness of the ordering. Because what we're doing here is we're saying, at this point, we have understood everything that we need in order to build, uh, to, to go ahead and build this. At this point, by this point, we have understood everything to make all the important decisions. So here's the problem. We're gonna make all the really big decisions. And yet we've, make, we've ignored the detail, the detail, the things that, we only see when we hit the code. Most coding problems are not coding problems. They are discoveries of problems with our architecture and clarifications and uncertainties in the domain and the detail of requirements. In other words, code, most of the problems experienced during coding and indeed during testing in a phase model are nothing to do with code and test. They are to do with analysis and design. It's just with their late discoveries. But the problem is we apply more control. We think, you know what, we should have spent longer at the beginning. Let's spend more time. Eh, that, that wasn't enough either. Let's do next time we do this, we should do even more at the beginning. And what happens is we end up rather than reducing the risk, we actually increase the risk. This is known as the law of unintended consequences. You wanted to avoid the risk of not knowing everything, but now you've actually increased it. What do I mean by increase? If you watch this point, it has moved further to the right. The point at which you commit to the kind of detail that gives you the feedback that you need, you pushed right towards the end. 
Two other observations, one of which is, notice the end has remained fixed. We know this is not how it goes. This is what ultimately led to the popularization in the 1990s of beta testing. What actually happens is the testing gets shunted off the screen. And then we say, you know what, we're gonna let the customer test it. So that's one of the realities. We either let the deadline drift and, or we let we say, yeah, the customer's gonna do this. But also we've been working towards an end state as if there were an end state. We are using the language of project management. A project is a finite game. In, in, um, uh, uh, so in kind of game theory, there's the idea of a finite game versus an infinite game. A finite game is something that has a, a clear objective um, and a, is bounded in some way, typically in terms of time. Um, football, it's a finite game. Chess, it's a finite game. Software development, not a finite game because software development is ultimately a product development. The goal of the game is not to win. The goal of the game is not to end. The goal of the game is to keep on playing. There might not be an end point. You cannot predict the ways in which this, you know, a successful product may, may live for a very long time. The real issue is the unsuccessful products are the one that tend to have an end date that we can uh, be more certain of. So here we have a bit of a problem. Again, another paradox. The point at which we know everything we need to know is too late for us to have taken advantage of that. How do we balance these con conflicts? So 30 years ago, Edward Berard observed that walking on water and developing software from a specification are easy if both are frozen. But even this doesn't yet capture all that we need to take into account. Because even if a specification is frozen, and I, even if nothing else changed, even if we fixed the technology in place, froze it in place, even if we made sure that there were no organizational changes, no technology changes, no requirements changes. In other words, we eliminated all sources of change. There would still be change. And that change would come from you because there would be a point where you hadn't developed the system and then a point where you had the knowledge of what was involved in developing the system. You would have experienced the specification. You, somebody else cannot know something for you. The fact that somebody has written something in a document a frozen specification is not the same as you knowing it. This is, by the way, a principle that sometimes people apply with, uh, or hope it doesn't apply with books. Um, you know, many people buy certain books but never read them, but they hope the fact that they've got them will transfer the knowledge to their head. It doesn't work like that. The fact that somebody else has understood the domain is not the same as you having built in that domain, plain and simple. The only way that you're going to get uh, the only way that you're going to be able to uh, navigate the water is by getting in the water. You've got to do this. So this month, it's February, for those who are watching later in time, that's one form of time travel we have kind of mastered. This month, February 2021, is marks 20 years since the Agile Manifesto um, uh, uh, was uh, put together. And Basically, the term Agile was coined, and indeed one of the first books to be published um, with the use of the word Agile was uh, the Scrum book. Um, Agile Software Development with Scrum, um, Ken Schraven and the late Mike Beadle. Um, and there's some interesting stuff in this book. Um, it, it's kind of uh, the production values of the book are not perhaps as high as they could be, uh, but there's some good stuff in here. And Scrum have been around since the early 90s. But what is interesting is something that is often overlooked. The whole scrum industry has grown up, which um, uh, kind of has diluted and, you know, messed up the fact that there were some really good ideas here. Uh, but one of the distinctions that Ken Schwaber draws is a, an important one. He, he talks about defined process. The defined process control model requires every piece of work be completely understood. Given a well-defined set of inputs, the same outputs are generated every time. In other words, we can know everything. Everything is knowable, and based on that, we are able to create something. This sounds great. It just doesn't sound like software development. Or rather, it does. What, what, what are the things in software that, given a well-defined set of inputs, generate the same output every time? Compilers. This is a solved problem. Modern compilers were invented in the 1950s. Um, in other words, we understood the language well enough, we understood the semantics well enough, we understood the target platform well enough that we could automate the whole process. But even then, even in the 60s, people weren't entirely sure about compilers, let's put it this way, that um, the Apollo missions, the code that was used for the Apollo missions was hand compiled, the ultimate in software craft. Hand compiled is exactly what it sounds like. People, uh, the code was written in a high level language, uh, 
MIT Algebraic Compiler, MAC. Uh, and then people using tables and books would compile it into assembler by hand. And importantly, you have different teams doing this and different people so they could cross check that they ended up with the same result. That was the only way to get that kind of level of confidence for human flight safety. These days, clearly we fully understand it. So this is also the same with our, with our build systems. By the time you have defined everything, you can automate it. That is what we've been getting better at. In the history of software development, we've been getting better and better at defining things, getting the knowledge that we need that is complete and sufficient enough that we can automate something. And that sounds great, except when you realize what's left. It means that the things we have not yet defined are the things that are harder and harder to define. And one of the hardest things to define is what do people want their software to do? And how are they going to build it with technologies they do not yet know about? Huh. It turns out we need a different process model, the empirical process control model. It expects the unexpected. That's its point. It doesn't say we will have answers for everything that will be correct. It says we can have answers and we will evaluate them empirically and we will adjust. It, it provides and exercises control through frequent inspection and adaptation for processes that are imperfectly defined. In other words, we don't know everything, but that doesn't stop us from making pro uh, progress. And the results from this are unpredictable and unrepeatable, but that's not a bad thing. Sometimes that sounds chaotic, but actually it's, it's fine. What it means is that because they're unrepeatable, you won't keep making the same mistakes twice. There is no value in doing something and then repeating the mistake. I want my development processes to be unrepeatable. The first time I do something is the first time I do something. I know relatively little about it. The second time I do something, I probably know more about it. So perhaps I don't know everything, but I should be able to avoid issues that I had uh, before. I don't want to repeat those. You don't want your development processes to be repeatable. This is a myth that was kind of put about kind of, I don't know, um, the uh, CMMI, the uh, capability maturity model. Um, you know, there are some interesting ideas there, but some of them are really problematic. So what does that give us a as a development process? This is your development process. I mean, of course, there's other activities in there. You know, you always want to be testing. You always want to be asking questions about your domain. Um, you always want to be doing things like uh, prototyping, evaluating possibilities uh, and, uh, and so on. And it's all bound up with a continuous thread of coding. But as we're talking about the architecture of uncertainty, I'm going to focus on the architecture, which is design. However, there's one other thing. Let's not fall into a trap of visualization. Notice how everything on your screen is currently beautifully aligned left to right. Thank you very much, PowerPoint, for helping me align these things. But the real world is not like that. The whole point is it's not repeatable. The whole point is you adapt. That's the point of this stuff. And you adapt by looking at the detail. So Jack Reeves, um, nearly 30 years ago in what is software design. So he made a break with the previous view of what is design. People had previously thought, oh, there is design and then there is programming and that is separate. These are somehow divorced from one another. Now, I'm not saying everybody thought that, but it was the dominant view. Jack Reeves came out and said, no, actually, let's look at this. Let's be serious about this. What is programming? So the guys at Commit Strip captured this uh, perfectly. And here you see um, here you see a project manager talking to a developer. He says, ah, oh, you know what? Someday we won't even need coders anymore. We'll be able to just write the specification and the program will write itself. Oh, wow, you're right. We'll be able to write a comprehensive and precise spec and bam, we won't need programs anymore. Exactly. Do you know the industry term for a project specification that is comprehensive and precise enough to generate a program? Uh, no, code. It's called code. That's the whole point. Code is not an implementational mechanism. There is, if you're working in a language like JavaScript, the distance between JavaScript and your processor, what is actually happening in the firmware is kind of like the distance from here to the nearest uh, uh, nearest other star system. Alpha, well, Proxima is actually closer. Um, so, um, you know, <laughs> there's a huge difference. You're not describing what the machine is doing. You are using a formal notation. This kind of gives rise to this observation. The act of describing a program in unambiguous detail and the act of programming are one and the same. Now, I've had people variously comment on this and they've not, missed, they've not understood it. I'm not saying that describing a JavaScript program is the same as writing a JavaScript. I'm saying describing a problem to the point at which you can implement it is an implementation. You have used all of your facilities to precisely define. You have programmed, that is what it is. 
As Jack Reeves observes, coding actually makes sense more often than believed. And the process of rendering the design will reveal oversights and the need for the additional design effort. In other words, this is a, basically a, an approach that Dan, uh, Dan Turhurst North refers to as deliberate discovery. You don't know everything, but I tell you what, the best way to find out is to put ourselves in the situation where the, some of the things that we don't know will come towards us and we will stumble over them. The earlier this occurs, the better the design will be. So the biggest problem that we have is we over, we overvalue what we know. Um, now some time, he wrote Black Swan and Anti-Fragile. His first book, Fooled by Randomness, made this observation. People overvalue their knowledge and underestimate the probability of their being wrong. Human beings are terrible with things like probability and time, which is unfortunate because that's what we're talking about. Uncertainty is about probability. Risk is about probability. Time. Yeah, that's how we deal with things in the past, the present and the future. It turns out we're not very good at either of, uh, either of those three. Well, I'm not very good at numbers today. So this is the problem. You will find many people, and you may be that person, and I'm sure I have been that person, who are very confident about what they know. And they say, oh, that's not a possibility. Oh, that's not going to happen. I think one of the best things about social media is that we are able to go back and see the things that people have said and, and see how it turned out, whether that is politics or whether that is software development, whether that is project management, uh, whether that is adoption or launch of products. We can actually go back. And what we find is that people are mostly wrong. And they like the sense of certainty. They have, they do not have a good grasp of how much they do not know. So this is the first thing. Um, let's classify our knowledge. There's this nice model that uh, Philip Armour uh, came up with um, uh, in 2000. Uh, five orders of ignorance. Uh, lack of ignorance is zero. So it's nice, it counts from zero. Lack of knowledge, lack of awareness, lack of process, lack of meta ignorance, right. This does not really necessarily help you until I explain it. But let me just start. The fifth one, meta ignorance, is you do not know the five orders of ignorance. We're going to solve that one. OK, so let me put these into slightly more familiar terms. The known knowns, the known unknowns, the unknown unknowns, unknowable unknowns. Right. What are the known knowns? Those are the things I know I know. That means this is a defined problem. I know everything there is that I need to about this. OK, I am familiar with something. If you tell me that, I go, yep, I knew that. Then there's the known unknowns. Let's say we're going to start using some, uh, we're going to start using some new framework choices in our stack. We've not used some of them before. You know, I know that we haven't used those. It's not a surprise. What I need to do is account for the fact that there are some unknowns there. That's fine. I know that there are unknowns there. So the first thing I need to do is recognize that there are things that um, there are things that I know that I don't know, and those may impact a project. Um, this is important. The first thing, unfortunately, though, is that human beings devalue these. Because unfortunately, we have a feedback cycle that basically says, you know, those things that you don't know. Uh huh. Yeah, they're probably not that important. Well, why are they not important? Well, if they were important, you would know them. Oh, yeah, of course. I only know important things. So things that I don't know are not that important to me. Right. So this is kind of the dialogue going on in your head and it gets downgraded, but at least we're aware of it, although sometimes we don't give it the relevant, the relevant significance. Then it gets more exciting. And this is where we end up with the deliberate discovery space. Unknown unknowns. I did not know that I did not know that. Unfortunately, this is kind of most of software development. And notice where estimates live. Most people estimate based on known knowns and a little bit of known unknowns. And they're not very good at estimating on the unknown unknowns. This is why we need to do small steps. This is why don't make all your big architectural decisions at the earliest point. Let's put it another way. Let us make all our really important decisions that are going to be impossible to change or hard to change at the point we know least. At the beginning of any project or any endeavor or any development period, you will never know less than you do now about what you're going to build. Now is the worst time to make the really big decisions. So make a couple of decisions and see how that goes. Build incrementally, get that feedback and keep watching what's actually happening rather than what you think is happening. Then there's the unknowable unknowns, those things that we do not have a process for finding out, that even in the presence of deliberate discovery, I cannot know these. Pandemic, there's a good one. I don't think anybody accounted, nobody, nobody suddenly said, you know what, um, in 2019, nobody said, 
you know, we really ought to accelerate the digital transformation of our company. Why? Well, I think there's going to be a huge global pandemic that's going to shut everything down in 2020 and uh, with repercussions that go to 2021, 2022 and beyond. Oh, yeah, you're right. This is a good idea. <laughs> nobody did that. And nobody had that as a known known, a known unknown or an unknown unknown. And there is no way to find out unless you have a time machine. This, by the way, also is a reminder uh, in case you ever use this phrase or see this phrase. Sometimes people talk about prioritizing requirements by business value. This is actually against the laws of physics. You cannot prioritize requirements by business value because you do not know the business value of something until after it has been built, deployed and the system has been sunset. You have no idea. You have an estimate, which I guess is an idea, but you don't know that. You can prioritize by estimated business value, but that's not the same as business value. There's a huge difference between actual and estimated. So don't, if I know that you're watching this, don't let me catch you ever talking about prioritization by business value, because you can't do it. It's in violation of the laws of physics. And if you have found a way around that, such as time travel, then I think we, we all deserve to know. So this is the problem. Most of software development is in this uh, later part of the landscape. And yet we work as if everything is in the known knowns with a little bit in the known unknowns. This kind of highlights the point that what we're doing with software development is exactly as Grace Hopper, who, guess what, invented the compiler. Uh, she's often credited with the invention of the compiler. So this is a nice time with defined processes. She highlights this. She said, to me, programming is more than an important practical art. It is also a gigantic undertaking in the foundations of knowledge. This is applied epistemology. This is a philosophy made real and encoded. This is a challenge to us. So how do we get knowledge? The process of acquiring knowledge has a name. It's called learning. And this is how, again, back to Neil Gaiman, this is how, this is what we need to do. We need to finish things. That's what you learn from. You learn by finishing things. You need to finish more things more often. And that becomes, that tells us, informs us the shape of our life cycle, which becomes empirical. Let's plan a bit, do a bit. And right, let's just pause there for a moment. Plan, do. Kind of waterfall style is we do lots and lots of plan, 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 plan. Then we do, 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 do. And then perhaps we decide we're going to do basic iterative and incremental development. Plan, do, plan, do, plan, do. That's a, an improvement because it means we can actually sense the progress and calibrate the progress and people have early access and early knowledge. This is great. The problem is this is not yet what we would call agile or indeed empirical. We're missing something. The problem is that most people who think they're doing scrum are just doing this. They're not, they're doing something, but it's not really what we would call agile. Your knowledge is gonna come about through a period of consolidation, reflection, and asking questions, being awkward, studying. Okay. Sometimes people call this the check stage. I'm not very keen on that term. Um, it, it was originally known as the study stage. I like the word study over check. Why? Because study sounds slow. You're supposed to slow down and spend time here. You're supposed to reflect on things and kick ideas around and talk to people and go, what about this? And is that really, what's, what's really going on here? And if there are issues, what are the trends? How do we address them? Let's act. This is also known uh, more constructively as adjust. So this is the deming Schuart cycle. And originally it was PDSA, um, Plan, Do, Study, Act. People started using the word check instead of study. That's not particularly helpful. Adjust was a later refinement, and I think that's quite a helpful one. Um, let me just check something uh, here. No, no, that's fine. Okay, so what does this tell us? It tells us architecture is a hypothesis. That's what we're getting needs to be proven by implementation measurement. So architecture is, if you like, it's always contingent. It's always conditional. Here's our current thinking, or this is my idea. This is, I believe we should build it like this. That's great. Let's have a belief. That's fantastic. But let's make that belief testable. Let's actually go out and build it. Yeah, that's what we mean by implementation. Build it. Rather than let's build everything, let's build a thing, a simple thing. I have an idea. This is going to improve performance. Let's build it and we can measure it. But also this measurement time scale is not just over the milliseconds and seconds. It's not just about performance. It's also when somebody says, let's build something. And if we do it like this, if we add an isolation layer in here and do interfaces like this or interfaces like that, you know what? I think it's going to make, I think it's going to make maintenance easier. I think it's going to deal with some of the changes we might experience more easily. Now, remember, we can't predict the changes we're going to have perfectly, but we can do this probabilistically. 
but we could also, with any probability, we could also be wrong. So we need to measure that, but how do we measure it? Well, we measure it over a longer time scale. In other words, we need to remember to go back six months from now. Yeah, we said we, we were gonna do this because it made the code easier to maintain. Now we have six months, we can reflect, we can go back through the repo and look and go, yeah, you know what? It is easier to maintain. If we look at the localization of changes and bugs and effort involved, that's great. Or alternatively, oh my goodness, this is too complex. It's actually not made things easier to change. Although our intention was to make it easier to change, actually that's not been the result. This is another problem when it comes to things like overvaluing our certainty. We assume that our intention, desired purpose is as good as the implementation. Sometimes we do really dumb things, even if they're for the right reasons. Yeah, oh, I'm gonna solve this problem. Then we do something really bad. And actually only half of that was wrong. Our intention was good, but the realization was not right. That's where we adjust, that's where we reflect. So the overall sense is that our development process is no longer a linear thing. It is a process of investigation and inquiry, of breaking things down into smaller things and trying things out. It feels like we're losing control, but actually we're gaining control here. So we need to, be, we need to make peace with the fact that we're not good at knowing everything. As Randy Shout says, if you don't end up regretting your early technology decisions, you've probably over-engineered. And that gets to the next point, the kinds of smells that we get in code very, um, you know, what, what happens to our code over time? Well, there's obviously the case of temporary workarounds um, that become somewhat permanent, hence temporary. There's obviously the problems where people do the right, th do the wrong thing for the right reason. Um, in the refactoring book uh, by Martin Fowler, um, he talked about um, a smell uh, that identified by Brian Foote, speculative generality. Uh, you know what, we might need this someday. Oh, okay, let's put loads of extra stuff in uh, to make this possible. Let's make it more configurable. That's another good one I love uh, from Dan. You have a problem. You decide to solve it with configuration. Now you have problems. In other words, we're doing, we're doing something that actually causes us further problems down the line, uh, although our intention is good. It doesn't mean that the realization is going to be good. Uh, and by the way, just before anybody messages, am I saying configuration is bad? No, I'm not. I, am I saying that it's never the right solution? No, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that sometimes people reach for that, reach for that solution a little bit too quickly and they end up with more complexity than they can manage. This is an iterator interface from um, Corber IDL in the 1990s. I don't think anybody's attached to this. It is one of the most ridiculous pieces of interface design I've seen in a long time. Uh, if you know what an iterator is, you're sitting there looking like, how could you have made such a simple idea so complicated? Because in software development, Anderson's law is one of our overriding laws. I have yet to see any problem, however complicated, which when you looked at it in the right way, did not become still more complicated. This was an example of speculative generality. It was supposed to be a general purpose for solution. The problem is nobody has a general purpose problem. They have specific problems. This is an iterator also in Corber IDL from the Corber services, but it solves a specific problem. And it actually does it quite well. It's just about the right size. So we need to be very cautious about some of the habits we have. Um, so 97 things every software architect should know, not a book that I edited, but the first book in the series and a book I contributed to, um, one of the things I contributed, you can find this article on my blog, or rather you can find the extended remix of this on my blog. The best route to generality is through understanding known specific examples. Focus on their essence, find the essential common solution. In other words, simplicity before generality, use before reuse, or simplicity through experience rather than generality through guesswork. And we must recognize that when we published and pushed these things out, we need to be careful not to it's okay to guess, it's okay to try things, it's okay not to know everything, but be very careful about the degree to which you commit it. If we push something out, we must recognize that it's gonna be harder to change. Things become significantly harder when they cross organizational boundaries. So notice that, that quote from Grady Booch, that idea of um, significance uh, uh, determined by cost of change. A, what can be a small decision within our code base if we keep it private? We can try things out and it's relatively easy to change, but the minute you push it across a boundary, it becomes significant and hard to change. It becomes an issue of support. And Josh Block used to work for Sun. Yeah, there's a whole load of packages in the uh, Java, um, Java uh, uh, distro that are 
called com.sun. There is no such company anymore. Um, the point there is that that is now hard coded because they have now, they can't rename that. It's stuck. It's a, it's a snapshot of history. Um, you know, it, if it belonged in a single code base, I could easily refactor it, but it doesn't. It's to do with the weight of dependencies. So here's the thing. Prediction is very difficult, especially about the future. And what I love about this quote is, what I love about this quote is that we're not even sure who actually said this. It's probable that it was Niels Bohr, but actually it's not entirely clear. And that's a statement about the past. Don't worry about the future. We can't even predict the present or the past very well. We're not as well informed as we would like to believe. And our ability to guess and second guess, if you stick around and look at any API, I was reminded of this version, uh, this um, uh, one recently. So I thought I'd throw it into the slides. Um, once upon a time, I was a Windows programmer and uh, dealt with 16-bit Windows. And here is a monstrous um, uh, create window function, uh, 11 arguments uh, you need to pass in. And how good are, were they at predicting the future? Well, one of the things about the Windows API that I think is really interesting is that it's lasted for uh, three and a half decades. So we can actually have we've actually got, an ex we've got, we've only got a few examples of things that are still actively used and how they evolved. So it's moved from 16 to 32 to 64 bit. It's moved across um, uh, other aspects and changes on platforms. And we see that some of the things have not worked out well. So first of all, there was a recognition, oh, you know what? Maybe not everything is ASCII. So we're gonna have an ASCII version and then we're gonna have a wide character version, which is gonna be Unicode. Uh, Unicode's not stable either. Um, so, and then it's like, we've got 11 arguments. Oh, you know what? We need a 12th argument. So let's add that. It turns out that, uh, and notice it's an extended version. You know, the, here's the point. Um, the, uh, Alan Perlis noted this actually before Windows was created. If you have a procedure with 10 parameters, you probably miss, miss some. So here, as we close down the talk, how do we predict the future? Or how do we find and structure our uncertainty? Well, the first thing is, if you end up with the, if you end up, you know, procedure with 10 parameters, you probably miss some. What Alan Perlis is saying here is, you know what, 10 is as good as 11 is as good as 12, statistically speaking. So therefore, when we have long chains of arguments, when we have unbounded fields in a class, that's going to be, that's going to attract change. We know that's going to change. The probability of it remaining stable is incredibly low. So although I don't, I can't, you know, I can actually say, we're uncertain about this. Oh no, but I'm sure we only need 10. No, because you have 10, it is an uncertainty. Break it down, decompose it, destructure it. We can also look to elements here. Here we see two buildings on the cover of Stuart Brown's How Buildings Learn. Two buildings side by side in the 19th century on the left-hand side. They look identical. And yet nearly 150 years later, they look radically different. Buildings do change. They just do so at a time scale that we don't tend to observe. But we can look at the layers of change within a building and understand that actually the location of the building, the site, is much more stable than, say, the services. For example, um, the lighting, the air conditioning, um, the heating, uh, the cabling. So therefore, we should design according to the rate of change. And this is indeed a pattern from the big ball of mud pattern language, shearing layers. Different artifacts change at different rates. Therefore, factor your system so that artifacts that change at similar rates are together. So here, what we can do is we can, we might not be able to predict the future perfectly, but we can forecast based on a number of techniques, including recognition of the past, probabilistic forecasting based on the past, what has been changing in our system. One of the benefits of a legacy system is that it's old. It has data. You can look at what changes. You've actually, you can do exactly that. We can measure. There's our set of measurements. Hey, look, this is really stable, but this keeps changing. Ah, but the thing that's really stable keeps depending on the thing that keeps changing, which causes a churn and causes us deployment and testing issues. You know what, maybe we should invert those dependencies. Good idea. In other words, we're gonna make this empirical, make it data-driven. We can use the history of a system to inform how we might respond to its future. We can also use other techniques. You know, I gave you the argument list one, but actually Parnas gave us another ob observation to do with fundamental modularity in the early 70s. It, it, you know, um, modules are a 1960s idea. Parnas, however, gave us our modern understanding, uh, 1971 and 72, this is a 72 paper. And he says, we propose that one begins with a list of difficult design decisions or design decisions which are likely to change. 
each module is then designed to hide such a decision from others. And when we say module here, don't think of this as, oh, it's a JavaScript module, a Python module, uh, a C++ module, or a Java module. Each of these languages uses the term module slightly differently. I mean it in the broad sense of anything that is modular. So at the scale of a large component um, or even a service or right down to a class. And that idea is what are the things that are likely to change? Sometimes we know those in advance. How do we know those? Because we're arguing with our colleagues. I, I think we should use this approach. No, I think we should use it. Right, stop right there. Use that to help you structure the decision. Or you have no solution at all. Oh, we don't know how to do this, but we know what we want. Keep that decision private, okay? Hide it away. This isn't just encapsulation though. This is all the way through your architecture. I keep running across websites that have .php in the URLs. What? Why are you publishing your implementation decisions to use PHP? You know, that could easily well be rewritten in another language. Nobody needs to depend on your internal choice. So um, I kind of talked about this idea of using uncertainty as a driver. And this idea of if you're debating with your colleagues when a design decision can reasonably go one of two ways, take a step back. Instead of trying to do what we normally do, which is I need to decide, or in fact, no, what you're doing is you're trying to convince your colleague that your design is right. They're trying to convince you that theirs is right. Stop right there. Take a step back. What do I do that reduces the significance of this if we need to change from A to B or B to A? The most interesting thing is not which one it is, it's the fact that there are choices. So therefore we should not have strong coupling to things we are uncertain about. And we can determine uncertainty just by our social interactions, by various clues, and also by the past. So this is really a story of making peace. Uncertainty is an uncomfortable position, but we need to make peace um, uh, with that because certainty is an absurd one. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm gonna stop right there. Um, and if we, I don't know if we have any time for any questions, um, but um, if there is, I'm happy to answer questions. Otherwise, I hope that's been good for you. Um, there's obviously other things that we could be saying about this, but I think that is reasonably self-contained. Thank you, Kevin. You're very welcome. <laughs> um, I, I must say, I, I, I love the, you know, what struck me, I. I love that quote, uh, if you don't regret your archi early architectural decisions, you've over-architected your system. I, I believe yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, I think that, and that's a really important thing because sometimes what we try and do is we, we try to eliminate something. In fact, you can kind of find this in our vocabulary. We sometimes use the word eliminate rather than reduce or contain. And eliminate is a very strong term. Uh, we, we try to eliminate the uncertainty. We try, okay, I'm gonna over-engineer so we will never, you know, we're going to add all of these possibilities so we will never have to change and everything will be right. Unfortunately, that's not going to work out well. What you should be doing is looking to reduce the effect. It's Things are going to happen. Change is going to happen. Don't try and pretend it's not. What your challenge is not to eliminate that. It's to kind of like figure out how to kind of localize it and isolate it. And, you know, sometimes you're going to be wrong. Sometimes you're going to have regret. Um, that is the nature of human existence. I don't intend to, you know, software development will not change fundamental aspects of the nature of human existence. The human condition remains constant. So we need to be careful how ambitious we are. And it's a case of like, yeah, you know what, we're going to get some things wrong and that's okay, but we can certainly reduce the effect. That's the thing. Reduction. So I sometimes get react a little bit when I see websites uh, or blog posts making advice, eliminate something. And it sounds tidy, but I just don't think that's the way we should be thinking. It's about reduction and containment. That's, that's, that's a more achievable goal. Yeah, I think it all, yeah, uh, I fully agree, first of all. Uh, I think your, your talk reminds me of, uh, you know, that, that part in the pragmatic programmer where they, they were comparing the, the ways to kill something. Uh, one way is to, to, you know, spend a lot of time just aiming and you have one bullet and if you yeah, miss... The tracer shot, bullet, yeah. Tracer, yeah. tracer bullet. And, and uh, the other is just to, to get a machine gun and start uh, firing tracer bullets. Which, which yeah. I believe is a more approachable uh, approach. More yes, approachable. it is an approachable approach. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I think that's exactly right. You know, unless somebody tells you, like in a film, you know, in films, we've only got one bullet and a really important thing to happen. Okay, but that's for films. 
you know, if you have the one bullet, clearly you're going to need to do something. But that's not the case. It turns out that in software development, we have more time than we think we do. It's just that we're really bad at organizing time. Um, you know, it, it's, I, I actually said this to a team it was about 10 years ago. I said this to a team. We, I kept visiting them and they, ah, they were writing documentation, various bits. And eventually it's just like I gave them recommendations. And then eventually they said, oh, okay, well, we're doing it like this. And I said, well, hang on, that's not really the best way to do it. Perhaps if you did it like this or like that. And I said, yeah, you said that before. Yeah, well, we don't have any time anymore. Um, we, we just don't have enough time on this project. And I said, you have more time than any other team that I know because nobody else would have spent a year and a half wasting time like you have. <laughs> you produced a lot of interesting Word documents, but honestly, you could have spent this time coding. And instead of writing Word documents about code you hadn't written, you could have written documents about code you had written. That's the empirical approach. We write the experimental write-up after we've done the experiment, not before. That's called faking your results. <laughs> so, yeah. so that's what, you know, in other words, our documentation, our documentation is more valuable if it's real. And normally what we find is that it tends to be a little bit tighter and more, you know, it, it, it's more realistic if we've actually built the thing. Here I'm describing a thing that exists rather than something that could exist and let's add lots of stuff. I'm trying to program in a word processor or programming in markdown either one not good the idea here is like well why do we describe a thing that we built and why we built it you know what that sounds like incredibly reasonable we can write it alongside and afterwards and some before some during some after so it's about bringing these things that were historically separated and bringing them together in time so they interleave you know if you like let's call this continuous documentation yeah everything every other thing has the word continuous put in front of it continuous design continuous architecture continuous documentation it's all there that so totally makes normal. sense yeah. but uh, i think it's also tough because it's also a cultural thing i mean uh, yes the tolerance of to uncertainty or let's say the intolerance uh, towards it uh, differs from people to people yeah, and that I think is the hardest thing because it, when you understand why it is that people end up doing this, um, it, it because, yeah, we understand, of course, because we don't know stuff and we respond to it differently. And sometimes individuals respond differently to certain pressures. And, uh, and sometimes one person is getting really uptight, oh, we need to plan this. And the other person is like, no, 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 chill. Honestly, if we spend our time worrying about this, then we will have spent time worrying about it, but we won't have made progress. But tell you what, if we make progress, we'll have found out the answers that we need to the thing you're worried about. Um, and this is, you know, anybody who's experienced anxiety will also be, <laughs> understand <laughs> the problem here as well. This is very human. Um, so we should not be surprised by it. But once we've recognized it, it's case like, right, okay, how do we do it? That's why I keep referring to these things as paradoxes, because sometimes the obvious thing actually makes it worse. The obvious solution is actually makes the problem worse. And that, that's, that's, the, that's the thing that we struggle to deal with. Yeah, so it does boil down to uh, experience and practice and also discipline. Yeah, yeah, towards, uh, yeah. Try, you know, sometimes it's like this. Uh, yeah, in fact, I, I think one, one of those things, I think the, the first, let's see, 2001, 20 years ago, that in fact, it was the first XP Day conference in London. And Martin Fowler did a keynote. I went along. I even wrote a uh, write-up for a magazine about the, the about the day. It was great fun. But one of the things they did was the Lego workshop where you try to apply extreme programming practices to building a Lego Mindstorms robot and having it do something. And what was really interesting about this was what happened when time, what happened when time got tight? And we had four teams in the room and two of the teams, basically they abandoned all the discipline. It's like, uh, okay, we, we, we're, just, we're not gonna do checks. We're not gonna do review. We're not gonna do pair Lego building. We get, uh, we're not going to build a second copy as a version so we can keep updating. And, the, and those two teams did incredibly badly. The other teams that said, OK, I feel, we feel we need to rush, but actually, you know what, let's just keep on doing what we're doing. The results were, you know, their, their Lego Mindstorms robots were far more successful in the challenges. And that's the hard thing is the urgency makes us want to do something different. But actually, what we should do is just stick to what we're doing. Steady as she goes. You know, it's just like that's why we talk about things like uh, an iterative heartbeat to a project. You know, how do you know that the project is still alive? Take its heartbeat. Oh yeah, still alive. Whereas, oh my goodness, it's erratic. I, I can't sense a heartbeat. Oh no, suddenly there's a lot. It, that's unhealthy. So therefore we're looking for that steadiness is the thing that will get you through. And, uh, and, and that is, as you say, practice. Uh, when Neil Armstrong landed on the moon, apparently his heart rate was pretty stable, even though he was doing 
some very last minute things. Um, it's just like, yep, no, I've trained for this. I'm, I'm good. All right. Thank you very much, Kevin. Thank um, you very much for inviting me back. Shall we put you on the list for September for the third Absolutely. Uh, series? Absolutely. For the third, we're going to make this a trilogy. I didn't realize until <laughs> just about an hour ago. You know what? There's th there's a theme here. Unreasonable, uncertain. I need another unword. Um, unconventional, perhaps. I don't know. Well, let's find out in September. I will see right. you there. Tomorrow morning, you're on the website. <laughs> yeah, that's how we're going to do it. Cheers, sir.